The African American Legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as religion, sports, aviation, business, literature, and recreation. We'll explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they've been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is Paul Sawyer, the executive director of the Friends of Van Cortlandt Park. Uh, Van Cortlandt Park is the third largest park in this great city of New York, yes. and you have the privilege of being the executive director of the Friends of Van Cortlandt Park. So mm -hmm. tell us about the Friends, tell us about your responsibilities as the executive director, and okay. then we'll talk later about some of the programs. Um, I've been with the organization for four years, and uh, it's a really wonderful, wonderful park, and I live very, very close to it. I actually grew up using the park. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a real kind of coming home for me in terms of uh, application and use. Um, the Friends is an organization that is dedicated to protecting, promoting, and preserving Van Cortlandt Park, and we do that through a number of different ways, uh, one of which is through programs, which we'll talk about later. The other is through preservation in terms of trail maintenance and helping to maintain certain areas of the park. And lastly is through advocacy in terms of uh, when the park is threatened or in a situation in which someone needs to speak out for the park itself, that is our role. And well, we've recently had... recently you had an opportunity to do that. Yes. Uh, the filtration plant uh, project. Uh, yes. tell, tell us a little about that project and what the Friends did. Well, uh, essentially the city uh, is under a, a federal decree actually to filter the water coming down from the Croton Reservoir and the city feels that the very best place to build this huge plant is essentially within Van Cortlandt Park under the ground. Um, and we essentially had to speak out and say look, this is not uh, a great place to do this and second of all there are certain procedures that you have to follow even if even if you want to do it and there was this has gone on since 89 I mean I'm really kind of a kind of a latecomer to it but this last flurry of the last year last year and a half has been it's 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 been fascinating I mean it's a really fascinating study in government and the way things get done on three or four different levels of government and people often say to me well Paul you know what, what is I said this is like playing a chess game on three different levels um, with people at different levels of government different levels of society and it's been incredibly uh, not so much rewarding but it has truly opened my eyes to the way our government in New York State functions well, what really happened with that? Is the plan going to be in Van Cortlandt? Well, well, it's, we're, we're, we're essentially waiting on information. Uh, there's something called an environmental impact statement that the Department of Environmental Protection has to produce and essentially lay out their plan for how they're going to deal with not only issues of building the actual plant, but the community that will be adjacent um, to this, to constant blasting, um, to an incredible amount of dust being put in the air, to the non-use of their park. And uh, they, have to, they have to produce this document. And once we see that document, we will essentially um, review it and see, that, see if they cover everything that they're supposed to cover in terms of protecting the community and the park. And there's something called mitigation, which is a nice way of saying they're going to give you some money because mm -hmm. they're destroying the park. Mm -hmm. uh, what about that mitigation money, which I understand is 200 or... Three hundred million dollars. It's it's two hundred and forty three million dollars. Uh, forty three million of it is supposed to go directly into Van Cortlandt Park. And I've often said to people, you could spend the entire two hundred and forty three million within Van Cortlandt Park itself and improve the park. But uh, there's forty three million that is set aside uh, potentially for Van Cortlandt Park, and then another two hundred million uh, that has been set aside for Bron. Bronx parks are kind of a renaissance for all of the Bronx parks mm -hmm. throughout the throughout the borough. So it was really kind of an incentive or a carrot really for the local elected officials, uh, most of which who do not represent Van Cortlandt Park, to go ahead and, and kind of vote on the bill that uh, had to be passed in Albany. And, and interestingly enough, 
it really did go down to the wire. Um, it really did go down to uh, almost midnight, and there was a lot of flurrying and running around. We went to Albany several times to uh, talk to not only our local officials, but also officials that had uh, all the people in the Bronx who were concerned about issues of environmental injustice. And uh, we got very, very close. We were four votes away from it not passing in the assembly. And um, eventually, uh, Governor Pataki did pass the bill. And uh, so now the bill has been passed, which I often say it's almost like you got the mortgage. You've been cleared on the mortgage, but uh, we don't want to sell you this house. Mm -hmm. So they have a lot more that they really have to do in order to even break ground within Van Cortlandt Park. So now, there's still hope. Van there's Cortland still hope. Park is what we call an urban park. In yes. New York City has probably the largest urban park system in the world. Yes. Central Park, Van Cortlandt Park, mm -hmm. Prospect Park, and mm -hmm. literally dozens and dozens of other smaller parks. Mm -hmm. What is the role of urban parks for inner city populations, particularly African Americans and Latinos? Well, the role has always been um, for people to essentially, everyone doesn't have a backyard in New York City. As a matter of fact, very few people have backyards in New York City. And very Manhattan. few people have a house in the Hamptons. I was going to say, that's the other thing. Very few people have houses that they can retreat to an hour, an hour, two hour drive. So it is really the opportunity for people in urban settings, and this is nationally, to go and, number one, exercise, which we know is very, very important, especially for children. Um, the second uh, option is really for, for people to, to recreate and um, see beautiful trails. One of the things that we have, one of the things that's most gorgeous in Van Cortlandt Park is really the ability to get away from the city, to walk amongst the uh, 13 or 14 miles worth of trails that exist within the park, and you really feel like you're in another world. And I've taken people on hikes on many an occasion, and they say, I can't believe I'm still in New York City. And I'm like, well, you are. Um, Van Cortlandt goes directly up to the Yonkers border, and people in Yonkers as well use the park for various types to of activities. To get to Van Cortlandt Park, all they need to do is to take the number one or the, the one nine, the four, yeah, the 242nd the one, Street, right, exactly. or the four on Jerome, exactly. and walk right into the park. Right, walk right into the park. Um, and there are a number of wonderful activities that are there. Horseback riding, you can fish. The nation's oldest public golf course is in Van Cortlandt Park, mm -hmm. and it is heavily used. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that because my office is literally on the golf course. Mm -hmm. There's a beautiful 13-acre lake. Um, mm -hmm. The wildlife is abundant. Um, you often see hawks, mm -hmm. um, obviously squirrels, chipmunks, but things that, that you normally just wouldn't mm -hmm. see. Um, in the city, as well as the, the natural areas that we have, wetlands, um, and, and a number of very, very interesting things that people normally just don't see in their, in their everyday life. In, now, in the urban parks have played a major role in the civil rights movement. Yes, yes. Uh, when I was a professor at New York University when I first started, I was an expert witness in a Supreme Court case uh, challenging discrimination in parks in Baltimore County and Maryland, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. helped to open up this whole idea of we have as much right yes. to use the parks as anybody else. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the story in Birmingham that you well, were talking about. In Birmingham, Alabama, often during um, the clips that people often see um, where, where the dogs are attacking the protesters and so forth, that is actually happening on park land because those citizens simply wanted to walk through the park, and they did not have access. And often the, the three demands really were um, they want to be able to sit at lunch counters, which was one which you often see people mm -hmm. pouring, and the um, the people being attacked, and, um, and, and, to, and to integrate the school. Yes, and, and to integrate right. the school. So, so you had the, the, these three demands, and one of the people, and the city of Birmingham uh, cemented their the holes on the golf course, rather than let African Americans play mm -hmm. on those courses. So. When you see that footage, that's about that's simply about Parkland, and and Park Parkland has often been places where we have gathered to celebrate our, our culture, our heritage. For example, in Prospect Park, there's a wonderful area called the Drummer's Circle, where people from really throughout the city come to participate in drumming, African drumming, where these guys travel from Queens and even New Jersey, and they bring these homemade drums and they sit and they drum. The Congo Square Drummers, and it's and it's and it's beautiful because there not only is there the drumming, but there are there has al always been a, a certain culture that's been around it, and people have been a being able to educate children. So, it's it's always been a place where we have been able to gather. March on Washington happened in open space when King gave the speech. 
all those folks you're looking at, that is national parkland. Mm -hmm. So it's always been a place where we have come together and gathered and really been able to ex express ourselves or fight for injustice. And many ethnicities, uh, European ethnicities, Asian ethnicities, Caribbean ethnicities use the parks, particularly mm -hmm. Van Cortlandt Park, because mm -hmm. the Bronx is a very diverse place. Yes. And one of the things that uh, I'm very interested in, that it's one of the centers of cricket. Yes. Cricket is an English game, a lot of Caribbean roots. Yes. And you go to the park on a Sunday or a Saturday, mm -hmm. and you see a whole bunch of cricket games going yes. on. Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually quite amazing. Um, there's an entire uh, society that's dedicated to cricket uh, from the uh, Caribbean community. And uh, they even have lessons uh, mm -hmm. that they do kind of once or twice a year where they teach people the game. I mean, it's, it's not actually cricket is a game that actually started and was very popular mm -hmm. in the United States prior to baseball. Mm -hmm. um, but they teach you and, you know, you see the guys running back and forth. You, you can't get it. And they, and they explain the different positions and they have the different positions. The same way we have center fielder. They have the, the specific names of... Um, of uh, the different players, the bowlers, the, the bowl, bowlers, right, the the bowlers pitcher, and, right. and, and, the, and the middle and all these different things. And what's the most interesting about cricket is that one game can go on for days, mm -hmm. days. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm watching these guys going, oh, well, we've been playing the same game for two or three days. And, and um, yes, and, and, and there's also uh, an Indian and a Pakistani community mm -hmm. as well that plays cricket there. Mm -hmm. There's an Irish community and a number of um, Gaelic games mm -hmm. are played in Van Cortlandt Park. Uh, mm -hmm. The game called hurling, which is almost mm -hmm. like a hockey type of baseball mm -hmm. game where these guys run and they bounce a ball and a mm -hmm. stick off of a thing and then they hit it across into a goal. Mm -hmm. Rugby is played there. There are a number of different, very, very different and amazing games that are played there. And then, of course, there's the cross-country running that we have up there, which draws well, the tens of Portland thousands of people. The cross-country trail is the most famous in yes. America. Or infamous, depending mm -hmm. on how, how quick you run it. Yeah, it's a, the, what is it, Cemetery Hill, yes. where they go yes. up and right. they get tired. Exactly. And for years, the National uh, Collegiate Athletic Association had their championships, and mm -hmm. still do. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, on any given fall, there must be thousands of young people tens of running thousands. in those uh, races which suggests that you have a very exciting job yes it, i mean a I, I can't very exciting job i can't i can't i can't uh, uh, put aside enough how, how much fun the job really is um in terms of watching these sporting events and recently we had the world archery championships mm -hmm. in van Cortland park which was you know this is just amazing um exposing and it not the park wasn't only exposed to the olympic committee but there were people from south africa france mm -hmm. britain who were there participating korea uh participating in this event and then all of them when i'd go by and watch it they'd say you know this is a great park it's a wonderful place i only thought that i thought the only park in new york city was central park and you know they're they're aware now that there's this beautiful wonderful park that uh, that exists in the bronx um and and w one other thing I wanted to say about the, uh, the events that happened in the park, the Big East Championships, cross-country championships, were held there this year. And one of the things that often happens in parks, and one of the things that we have been able to play a role in, is this ongoing kind of issue of the impact of events within parks and then the impact on the community. Because often when you get tens of thousands of people coming into a park, there's an immediate impact on the neighbors. Uh, so we have been able to play a role with the Parks Department and the local community in terms of trying to reach out and, and figure out a way where we can develop a plan to minimize the impact. That's of a very things. good point because uh, we were talking about Van Cortlandt Park and mm -hmm. the Friends as though mm -hmm. the Friends run Van Cortlandt Park. Actually, right. Van Cortlandt Park is run by the Parks. New York City Department of uh, Parks and Recreation, mm -hmm. and the Commissioner Adrian Benepe, mm -hmm. and uh, Dorothy Lewandowski, who is the Bronx Commissioner, and a lot of very, very dedicated people. Mm -hmm. And one of the roles, I assume, of Friends of Van Cortland is to keep the awareness of the park together yes. and yes. to help raise funds to fill those niches exactly. that the city budget might not be able to fill. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about some of those programs. Well, the main program that actually really started with Van Cortland Park was a teen program. Started in Van Cortland Park. Started in Van Cortland Park was a, was a teen program um, in which uh, some dedicated folks who lived in a local community wanted to essentially get teens to go in and essentially clean up the park and keep it keep it looking good. Um, and from that initial program, we were, we've been able to develop a summer program, 
a year-round teen program, a junior high school program, all involving environmental education, and in which the kids are paid and they receive job readiness training. And now we're looking into getting our year-round teens college credit uh, for participating in the program. So if a kid is in the 11th grade or the 12th grade and they're in our program, we are now going to, we're in the kind of in negotiation right now with Manhattan and Lehman College to talk about actually developing the opportunity for them to get some type of college credit out of the, out of the program. So they're getting paid, they're getting educated, and they're occupied which is, I think, one of the most important things that we can do for these young well, people. Well, clearly this doesn't happen without money. True. And the president True. of Friends of Van Cortlandt Park is Elizabeth Cook-Levy. Yes. And she and her committee has done a tremendous amount in fundraising. But in addition to which, you and your staff have developed proposals. Who mm -hmm. are some of the funders of some of these programs? The Arthur M. Blank Foundation. Uh, we received funds from the New York City Environmental Fund. We received funds from the Levitt Foundation in the past. And, and one other thing I, I want to say is that our team program is in conjunction with the Riverdale Neighborhood House, which mm -hmm. has been a relationship that we have shared in terms of sharing the responsibilities mm -hmm. of the program, getting the kids the job readiness training. So it's often wonderful when you can get two nonprofits that are concerned about the community and the young people in the community um, to really make something happen. And, and this program has gone on for over eight years. Um, so it's been really, really wonderful in terms of our relationship and getting these two, two nonprofits to work together. So it's, 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 been, it's been a very good relationship. Now, the Bronx is tremendous for its ethnic diversity. Yes. Uh, about a third African American, mm -hmm. a third Latino, and a third white. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been besmirched because of its poverty, mm. the so called South Bronx. Mm -hmm. But under the leadership of the borough president, Fernando Ferrer, and now Adolfo Carrion, the economic level of the Bronx is coming up. Mm -hmm. Bronx is up, as it's they say. It's a place, Absolutely. place where people want to go. Now, what is the role of the park, particularly Van Cortlandt Park, but the other parks, Katona Park and St. James and other parks, what is the role of the park in helping to make a community more alive, more oh. attractive? Well, I think a classic example of that, and, and, and I hate to jump out of the Bronx here for a minute, but I'm going to, is what happened essentially with Central Park. It's an issue of real estate value. When the park around your community or in your community is, is in not, in not in the greatest of shape, and there's crime and issues of that, it affects your real estate value. It's not a place that people want to go. There's a, possibly a higher crime rate. The beauty of improving a park and friends groups like ours throughout the city is that we offer the opportunity to improve the park and therefore increase and make the real estate value even more, you know, improve it for people who actually own those things. Van Cortlandt Park is interesting also in terms of businesses. The cross-country races that happen in Van Cortlandt Park, at, which are really at the 242nd Street and Broadway area of the Bronx, the money that those local businesses, the, the McDonald's, and the Burger King and the local Dunkin' Donuts. Good, healthy food. No, yeah, right. Good, uh, <laughs> but those kids go in there and they must spend hundreds of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. based on a couple of events mm -hmm. that happen within the park. And the businesses know. Mm -hmm. um, I've gone into a number of them, and I, you know, Paul, when are the races starting? You guys know when. Yeah, a couple of weeks, we'll mm -hmm. be ready. You know, mm -hmm. the pizza guy starts making extra pizza or ordering mm -hmm. extra dough because he knows that the economic mm -hmm. impact of the events within the park. So not only does it affect the real estate value, it affects the ability of local businesses to benefit from events that are held in parks. Let's talk a little about the topography of mm. Van Cortlandt Park. Mm -hmm. How many acres, what are the borders, et cetera? Exactly. Um, Van Cortlandt Park is 1,145 acres. And I often joke and say quarter to 12, mm -hmm. uh, 1,145 mm -hmm. essentially. Um, but people don't realize how big the park is. I mm -hmm. often say you could put Central Park and Prospect Park in Van Cortlandt Park with a little bit spilling over into Woodlawn Cemetery. Uh, the park is that big, and most of it is woodlands, forests, and so forth. There are a couple of areas where there are playgrounds. Van Cortlandt Park is bordered by the Woodlawn community, Yonkers, the Norwood community, the Kingsbridge Heights community, Kingsbridge, and essentially Riverdale. Um, and that's a pretty large area when you think about it. The park in terms of square acreage is about, no, not, so not square acreage, but from one side to the other, from going uh, west to east, is two miles. Um, and it's not flat. 
There are hills, uh, and there are a number of well-known trails that are in Corona Park, including the old Croton Aqueduct, mm -hmm. which comes all the way down from the Croton Dam and goes all the way down actually to 42nd Street, the reservoir. Mm -hmm. But you can actually see the aqueduct when you're walking down, walking in the park mm -hmm. on these very well-known trails. So it's a pretty, pretty big piece of land, and it is difficult to manage. It is very difficult to manage, and that's why we often go to the Parks mm -hmm. Department and say, look, you know, there's certain things that are needed. We kind of, there are times that we, when we consider ourselves kind of the eyes and ears of what is happening in the park. If there's some type of illegal activity, motorbikes or something like that, we get on the phone and we say, look, we saw motorbikes in the park today. We need a PEP unit or police enforcement patrol unit uh, to go in and really look and, and do something about this issue because it's illegal to have those spe uh, specific type of things in the park. It's uh, unusual that someone like yourself would take on the environment, mm -hmm. environmental education. Not mm -hmm. that many African Americans have gotten into this, uh, not because they are not interested, but mm -hmm. because of opportunities. Tell us a little about those opportunities. Wh why is it important? What are the opportunities for African Americans to get into this area of environmental education or environmental protection? Well, there are. The one thing I, I want to say is that in our teen program, and what's most interesting to me is that mm -hmm. when the teens come in, they know very little about environmental careers, the environment, mm -hmm. um, and when they leave, they are fired up. I, there's one young man who came down with us to testify in front of the city council, and we, were to, we went down to essentially talk about Im improving parks uh, funding. And when it was all over, he simply looked, he says, you know, I want to I wanna be an environmental attorney. He's currently mm -hmm. at John Jay. Mm -hmm. He's transferring to NYU. Mm -hmm. And he says he either wants to go to NYU Law or Columbia. And he's got the, I mean, I, mean, I, I honestly think he's going to do it. Yeah, right. But the alumni that have come out of the program really, <clears throat> excuse me, have, have continued their interest in the environment. And we have tracked them down. Some of them have gone to some very good schools. And even if they don't major in environmental education or environmental engineering, which is a huge field, that I think all young kids should look into. It's a huge, huge, wonderful field. Um, they still continue their interest in the environment. So they're either working on a local club, that's the environmental club, or they're working on lead leading trails. We have one young man who went to Dartmouth who came out of the program, and he's leading hikes in Vermont mm -hmm. at Dartmouth because of his knowledge mm -hmm. that he has, he has obtained in Van Cortland through our program. So there, there are a lot of wonderful opportunities. The one thing that, that has really kind of happened in the, in the African American community is environmental injustice. Things in which people, mm -hmm. there's, uh, particularly in Hunts Point, and areas in which there are issues like waste transfer stations and generators being built. And that's really kind of where you see um, African Americans and, and Latinos getting involved in, in this particular environmental issue. Uh, it is, it's, it's I, I can't emphasize enough how important it is for us to be involved in what happens to the air, the water, and the soil that is around us. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Um, so there are a number, and there, there are some other organizations that have some internships. We have internships. Sustainable South Bronx is an, another very good organization that has some wonderful opportunities for people to learn about the environment. So uh, it, they're out, it's out there, and don't, just because it's outside, don't think, just because it involves the environment, don't think you're going to be working outside all the time. Mm -hmm. It's very scientific, I say to young people. Uh, one of the other things that's very interesting is that as urbanites, and I mean all urbanites, not just African Americans and Latinos, but people of uh, European ancestry as well, is that we are afraid of the woods. It's something that we're taught from the time we were very, very small. <laughs> they were uh, bears. Yes, you know, <laughs> we, you know, uh, lions and tigers and bears or mine, all of that, and the, and the grim stories and so forth. The woods are a wonderful place, and hiking and walking in the woods is wonderful. Don't be afraid to go outside and truly enjoy yourself in natural areas. It, is, it can be an incredibly uh, spiritual um, opportunity, and we should look into it. I mean, there's, there's one gentleman I've actually met in Van Cortlandt Park, um, fisherman a number of wonderful, wonderful fishermen that I've been African-American, and, and they're teaching me the science of fishing. That mm -hmm. happens outdoors, mm -hmm. and it's a wonderful opportunity for people to, to participate. Uh, as you were mentioning before, environmental injustice, mm -hmm. that clearly is a political issue. Yes. It's an economic, it's a political issue, and unfortunately it has 
uh, fallen on minority communities, urban communities. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of political activist groups now yes. that are challenging the big oil companies, the big distributors, and mm -hmm. so on, mm -hmm. the waste, uh, dis uh, waste management, waste management, right, waste management people, right. of where you're going to put this. Mm -hmm. And I would assume that the Friends of Van Cortland Park is also interested in that, that issue. Well, I mean, case in point is, is the you know, the filtration. I mean, that's a classic example of, I mean, the filtration plant is, is, could potentially end up in the most densely populated community around Van Cortlandt Park, where there is not a lot of open space. Mm -hmm. um, there's an already an incredibly high asthma rate. So you got these, there, there'll be people, if it happens, and I often, I constantly say if, if it happens, there will be blasting, there will be dust in the air, there will be issues of people not being able to use the park essentially because of the activity that's going to be going on right next door to their playground. So mm -hmm. this is something that, that, that continues to go on. Now, from a engineering standpoint, they say this is the best place to put it. Um, we believe differently. There are other locations. Other locations exist. Um, DEP is aware of that. But why put it? so close and literally on top of a community that, you know, within three blocks, 10,000 families. I mean, that's, that's really kind of pushing, pushing the envelope. And this continually goes on in the Bronx and nationwide, um, where there are densely populated communities that end up with these different types of potentially hazardous um, uh, infrastructures. In, in there. Friends of Van Cortland Park is just one of literally hundreds of Friends of Parks Absolutely. groups in the city. Mm -hmm. uh, one concern that might be developed is if you depend so much on the volunteer mm -hmm. group to do the things that the city government ought to be doing, what impact does that have on city parks budget? Right. Uh, well, how do you get into the advocacy for park money? Well, we talk to our elected officials and there's, there's a wonderful citywide organization called New Yorkers for Parks. And they really pull from throughout the city. They pull people together to go down and lobby their um, their local officials, particularly their uh, their city councilmen and the mayor. Um, that's the most effective way to get more funds for parks. You're absolutely right. If you depend on the volunteers, and this has been a policy that the city has had mm -hmm. for quite some time, and everyone wants to um, reproduce Central Park, and that's just that's. It's a very, very different model, and it's not going to work in various types of communities throughout the city. If anyone wants to get in touch with Friends of Van Cortland Park, how do they get in touch? Well, well they can call us on the phone. We have a website, okay. which the is phone number the phone is number is 718-601-1460. And we also have a website uh, where you can reach us at vancortland.org. If you go in and search Van Cortland, we come up first. And so, today on African American Legends, we've been talking to with Paul Sawyer, the executive director of the Friends of Van Cortland Park. Thanks for being with us on today's thank, African American Thank you American for having Legends. me. It was good to be here.